The day after his 13th birthday, orphan Jax Aubrey wakes up to a world without people. But it's not the apocalypse, because the next day, this regular old Thursday. Riley, Jax's 18-year-old and very irresponsible guardian, lets him in on the secret. There are actually eight days in a week, and only certain people like Riley and Jax can live in all eight. But there are others, like the teenage girl who's been hiding out in the house next door, who exist only in the eighth day. Take a listen to this first chapter of The Eighth Day by Diane K. Salerni. The Eighth Day by Diane K. Salerni. Chapter 1. Jax pedaled home from the store and muttered in cadence with the rhythm of his bike wheels. This sucks, this sucks, this sucks. The groceries were heavy in his overstuffed backpack, but Riley had let the refrigerator go empty again, and if Jax wanted to eat tonight, shopping was up to him. Riley sucks. That was something Jax could grumble with enthusiasm. Riley sucks. Riley sucks. Billy Ramirez was always trying to convince him how lucky he was. I wish I had as much freedom as you do. He complained at least once a week. You mean you wish your parents were dead? Jax never said it out loud, thinking Billy would notice his silence and get the hint. Your guardian is so cool. Yeah, living with a guy barely out of high school who forgets to pay the electric bill is so cool. Often, Jax was tempted to offer a trade. He'd go live with Billy's parents, and Billy could come live with Riley Pendare. Traffic was steady this late in the afternoon as people drove home from work. Jax flinched every time an impatient driver veered around him. He missed his old home in Delaware, where they had had bike lanes. At the end of the block, Mr. Bloom was watering his new sod again. Jax swerved to avoid the spray from his hose. Miss me today, you old fart. And diverted onto the sidewalk in front of Riley's house, the smallest one on the street and the one most in need of a paint job. There was an old red Ford F-250 parked out front, so Jax knew who was visiting even before he went inside. This was not good news. He locked his bike to the rain gutter at the side of the house, then slung the heavy backpack off his shoulders and carried it up the front steps. The door opened directly into the living room, where it was dark except for the television. Thick drapes protected the room from even the tiniest threat of a sunbeam. Jax had once opened them to see if sunlight would shrivel Riley up like a vampire. It hadn't, but Riley had complained about the glare on the TV. Riley was watching his favorite show right now. A tunnel running beneath the pyramids lined with mica, which is used today for heat shields on spaceships. It's as if the place were designed for launching alien spacecraft. Alien spacecraft? Wrong again, dude. The guy on the recliner threw a crushed soda can at the host of extraterrestrial evidence. It bounced off the TV screen and hit the floor. Jax groaned under his breath as he closed the door. Wouldn't it figure A.J. Crandall would be here any time Jax brought food into the house? Is that groceries? Riley Pinder was sprawled on the sofa, still wearing his uniform from Al's auto. Thanks, Jax. I was going to go later. Yeah, right. A.J. lifted his shirt and scratched his great hairy belly. Did you happen to get cigarettes? I'm twelve, Jax reminded him. Darn. Then A.J. hefted himself up on his elbows. He's twelve? Yeah. Riley got up and followed Jax into the kitchen. Thirteen in a couple of weeks, right, Jax? Jax shrugged. His birthday was tomorrow, but it wasn't like he was expecting a party or a present. Riley dug through the grocery bags and found a frozen pizza and a package of hot dogs. He ripped open the pizza box and tipped the frozen disc into the oven. Almost thirteen, A.J. hollered from the living room. You think he's a late bloomer or a dud? What's that supposed to mean? Jax yelled back. Ignore him. Riley found a pot to put the hot dogs in. A.J. lumbered into the kitchen. Hot dogs and pizza. Nice. Are you eating here? Jax complained. They'd be out of food again by this evening. Pandare's not supposed to let me starve. We have an agreement. You don't look like you're starving, Crandall. Riley held out his hand, and A.J. produced a twenty which Riley stuffed into a flower jar on the counter. The kitty, Riley called it, 
both because it was where he kept the household cash and because it was shaped like a cat. AJ located a lone soda in the refrigerator. This isn't even cold, he complained. Fridge is threatening to quit again. Riley dumped the entire package of hot dogs into a pot of water and turned up the gas flame. Then he thumped soundly on the side of the old Kenmore. Some mechanic you are, Jax muttered. Riley pushed his hair out of his eyes. Refrigerator's not the same as a car, Jax. AJ snorted. <laughs> Just call you know who to come fix it. Every time I call her, she wants a favor in return. Poor you. Wish she'd call in a favor from me. Jax didn't know who they were talking about, and he didn't care. When AJ reached for the last grocery bag, Jax snatched it away. That one's not for you. He looked at Riley. Save me some food? Well, sure, said Riley, as if he hadn't eaten everything Jax brought home on other occasions. With a worried glance at the stove timer, Jax carried the bag out the front door and down the sidewalk to the house of his elderly next-door neighbor. As usual, Mrs. Unger met him with her wallet. What do I owe you, Jackson? She held up cash like she had to prove she had the money. I'll check the receipt. He put away her groceries while she followed him around the kitchen with her cane. Sorry I didn't buy any eggs, he said, checking the contents of her fridge. I thought the dozen I bought you last time would have lasted longer. The eggs are all gone? Mrs. Unger pushed up her glasses. I didn't eat them. Sure you didn't. Guess it was that ghost of yours again, he said cheerfully. Oh, she exclaimed as if he'd reminded her. I found my library card on the kitchen table. It must be time to exchange the books. I'll do it this weekend. You want more like these? Whatever these books are, get more of them. Mrs. Unger waved her hand at a stack of books on the counter. I don't read them, you know. Of course, Mrs. Unger didn't read romance novels. She borrowed them for her ghost, the one who stole her eggs, moved the spices in her cabinet, and rearranged things in her closet. Getting old and senile must be hard. Jax checked the receipt. Twenty-four seventy-nine. Here's thirty. When he protested, she said, Take thirty. You saved me a trip. Thanks. He folded the three tens into his back pocket. She kissed him on the cheek, and he groaned theatrically, even though he didn't mind. Anything else you need? He eyed her kitchen clock. The pizza would be about done. He needed to get back before AJ ate it all. Yard work, pulling weeds? Mrs. Unger smiled. I don't have any weeds. Jack took a look for himself when he ran back to his own house. Mrs. Unger had perfectly tended flower beds. He wondered how she managed it with her eyesight and her cane. The built-in flower beds along the side of Riley's house were nothing but hard-baked dirt, tough as concrete. Not even weeds grew there. His timing, for once, was perfect. Riley was just scraping the pizza off the rack with the cardboard box it came in, and Jack scored a couple slices and a hot dog. Riley kicked a chair away from the kitchen table, which was his version of an invitation to sit down. "'How's everything at the old lady's house?' he asked. "'Fine,' said Jax, walking past the chair and out of the kitchen with his plate. He wasn't going to stick around to eat with Riley and AJ. His bedroom was dark and cramped, with only one window." A wallpaper border circled the room, patterned with hound dogs wearing Confederate flag bandanas. When Jax had moved in, Riley said the place had come that way when he rented it. Change anything you want, he'd suggested. But Jax hadn't put any effort into redecorating his room, because he wasn't staying long. That's what he'd thought four months ago, anyway. He flung himself onto the bed and rested the paper plate on his stomach. At first, he stared at the ceiling while he chewed but eventually his gaze wandered around the room. The trombone he'd given up playing was still propped against the wall. Nearby was the telescope he'd gotten last year and lost interest in after one use. His dad had complained long and hard about that. Then Jax turned his head toward the photos on the bedside table. There was an old picture of Jax as a preschooler on his mom's lap, taken just before she'd gotten sick, and another of Jax and his father at the Grand Canyon last summer. 
Jax was smiling crinkly-eyed into the sun while his dad had put up a hand to shade his eyes. Why'd you do this to me, Dad? If Jax had swallowed the hot dog whole, it couldn't have choked him worse than his own anger. Jax knew the accident hadn't been his dad's fault. Someone, a drunk driver probably, had run his father's car off the road, causing it to plummet downhill and into the Susquehanna River. That person, whoever he or she was, had been the sole focus of Jax's anger until Riley Pender had showed up and stolen him away from the only family he had left. In the days after his father's death, Jax had been taken in by his mother's cousin, Naomi, and her husband. He hadn't known them really well before the accident, but they were family, willing to give him a good home. Then Riley had appeared at Naomi's with an affidavit claiming to be Jax's guardian. Rain Aubrey signed the guardianship of his son over to me, he told them, crossing his tattooed arms across his chest. This document says so. In the event of his death, I am supposed to take custody of Jackson Lee Aubrey. Naomi called a friend of the family's for help, a lawyer who came to the house and hammered Riley with questions and received little satisfaction from his answers. Who was Riley Pender to Rain Aubrey? Son of an old friend. Why had Rain Aubrey chosen Riley Pender, 18 years old and a stranger, as a guardian over his late wife's cousin? Riley had been particularly uninformative here. It was his wish. But one answer had been more upsetting than any other. When, Naomi had demanded, when did Rain make this arrangement? Three weeks before he died, had been Riley's reply. The lawyer thought the whole thing was ridiculous. Riley was too young and the situation too strange, and suggested they call child services to schedule a court hearing. Jax hadn't liked the sound of that, but it was better than letting this tattooed stranger take him away. Then Riley had a private word with the lawyer, gripping his arm and pulling him aside out of everyone's earshot. The lawyer called Naomi over, and Riley spoke quietly to her too, putting his hand on her shoulder. The next thing Jax knew, everyone had changed their minds. The lawyer said Jax would have to live with Riley while waiting for the hearing, and Naomi agreed it was necessary. It's just for a little while, she promised him. Jax watched in horror as his belongings were piled into the truck Riley had arrived in, which didn't even belong to him. Turned out he'd borrowed it from A.J. to pick up Jax for the five-hour drive to this little town in western Pennsylvania. It was during that long, silent drive that Jax's knot of anger began to grow larger. He found there was plenty to spare for Riley Pender and his own father. If you'd like to continue the story, you can check out The Eighth Day from our tween fiction collection, or it is available for immediate download through the Hoopla app. As always, I would like to thank you all so much for listening and wish you happy reading.